Um, good afternoon, everyone. Bye, thank you. Um, thank you so much to you, Karen, for this kind invitation, as well as the Afrikaans Unit at Languages, Cultural Studies and Applied Linguistics. And I would like to thank our interpreter, Linda, as well. So the University of Johannesburg is a leading proponent of the fourth industrial revolution in Africa. And I very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. And it's particularly exciting to see interest in the integration of arts and technology within the context of the creative sector. And this is uh, where my interest lies. So according to UJ Arts and Culture, there is limited discourse around this topic in both South Africa and on the continent. So the primary aim of my talk today is to at least try to provide an accessible introduction to AI poetry. And I'm here because my co-author Anil Bash and I built a language model or uh, an, a language AI, if you will, which we call Afriki, and uh, it stands for uh, Afrikaans Kunstmatige Intelligentie or Afrikaans AI. And we use Afriki to create poetry in Afrikaans. Uh, to our knowledge, we are first to attempt creative text generation in the language, but note that Afriki could probably work in uh, other local languages as well. So to those of you that are new to this field, I hope that the talk will help you approach the intersection of arts and technology, uh, of literature and artificial intelligence in a more confident uh, manner. And to colleagues and students of uh, literature specifically, if, if the subject piques your interest, creative AI only stands to benefit from literary perspectives. But more on that later. So in today's talk, I first introduce my overarching research project, AI as author. Uh, second, I will show some examples of AI generated poetry, including of course, Afriki's Afrikaans poems. Third, we'll pull back the curtain to understand a little better how this all works. Then I will discuss evaluation. That is how to decide if AI poetry is any good. And then finally, I outline uh, key ethical issues, as well as reflect on the potential impact of this technology on literature. And on this topic, especially, I would love to hear what the audience thinks afterwards. To kick start the discussion, I have prepared a, a short anonymous poll right at the end. Right, so let's begin by very briefly introducing AI as author. It is my three year interdisciplinary research project. It's funded by Turkey's Scientific and Technological Research Council. Uh, through this, I lead a small team at Koç University in Istanbul. And our goal is simple. It is to bring into conversation two seemingly unrelated fields, namely literature and machine learning on the subject of AI generated or AI written text. So what we try to do is we try to identify and bring potentially useful ideas from literary studies to bear on creative AI. So Afriki, Afriki uh, that is our work in Afrikaans poetry generation is just a small part of this larger project. And if you would like to learn more about our work, please visit the website authorai.ku.edu.to. So what inspired this project is the World Economic Forum's prediction in 2018 that AI will write a New York Times bestseller by the year 2049. And this is actually based on a study by Grace and colleagues. They conducted a large survey asking AI experts, when will AI exceed human performance? And the study makes an excellent point that AI writing technologies are progressing rapidly. And it might therefore impact the literary industry and even the study of literature. So I started to investigate and I was struck by the relative lack of involvement of literary scholars in this field. And this led to the AI as author research project. 
Now to date, as you may know, uh, scientists have already generated uh, various kinds of texts with artificial in intelligence, uh, from jokes and metaphors to essays, short stories, novels, even screenplays, uh, a musical, and of course, uh, poetry. So let's have a look at some poetry examples in various languages, uh, followed by the Afrikaans poetry of Afrikaans. Right, so a good example of AI poetry in English is Deep Spear. In 2018, the team uh, from IBM published verse generated in the style of Shakespeare. And the study received media attention and gave rise to the brain teaser, AI or not AI, that is the question. So I have a question for you. Uh, Looking at the results, and I, I, if, if you wouldn't mind, you can just write what you think in the chat. Looking at the results, uh, which stanzas do you think were written by Shakespeare and which were written by the computer? Right, um, here are the answers revealed. So the public struggle to distinguish Deep Spear from Shakespeare. Now this is probably due to unfamiliarity with Elizabethan English. I mean, if you, at the surface level, the quatrain structure, the vocabulary, they do look Shakespearean. And the texts are actually produced in iambic pentameter and there's a discernible rhyme scheme Though, as you might have noticed, uh, not strictly that of a sonnet. Uh, there's a grammatical error in stanza one. He twas. Uh, that is a straightforward indication that stanza one is AI generated. And then, of course, we could debate how meaningful and valuable this is. So since then, we have seen great progress in English, uh, which I'll mention again later. However, AI poetry has been created in many languages across the world. And I will show you now just a few examples, four examples uh, outside of English. So to start with, from the Chinese poetry generator, we have this lovely poem. Missing you, red berries born in the warm Southland, how many branches flush in the spring? Take home an armful for my sake as a symbol of our love. Another beautiful poem in Chinese. After a cup of unstrained wine, I have been a little drunk. I saw the clouds split the sky apart. On horseback, I passed through every road across the mountain but can only watch the red sun falling down with sorrow. Now in Finnish, uh, the title is Stately Houses. The man is a lamp, it will definitely go off. When is the lamp bright? And uh, Polish as well. A spark I gave, a spark has blazed and its booze has hazed. I will not remove, the spark will scatter. The grain behind me does not shatter. Already the hundredth spark is spilling and then a spark starts swilling. A spark has blazed, a spark has blazed, blazed the sun, the bottom it craved. Right, so I hope it's clear that you can see the Polish translations on the right-hand side. They, uh, some of the lines are rhyming. So what's going on with these brackets? Um, the researchers actually uh, those are the originally uh, original translations. The researchers altered the last words of uh, some of the lines to form rhymes in English as well, right? So to be clear, the exact translation uh, is given in square brackets. So on the Afrikaans invitation to this talk, it is written that Afrikaans is the third language in the world to create AI poetry. Now, although this would have been fantastic, 
there are many languages that have uh, already done so, including Italian, uh, Portuguese, French, uh, Bengali, and others as well. So to the list of languages, we add Afrikaans. Uh, I will now show you the four AI poems that we have published thus far, and then I'll explain how they were created. I just want to mention to any participants that have arrived late, uh, uh, if you click on the globe at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to, to hear the Afrikaans uh, version, the Afrikaans interpretation, just uh, for those of you that are joining late. Thank you. Right, so, so this, to our knowledge, is uh, the first AI poem in Afrikaans. Silver wit in the Suintu, silver white in the there beyond. Uh, I mean, <laughs> suggestions as to how to properly translate this uh, is welcome. I will now uh, read these four poems in the original Afrikaans. Uh, we'll give <laughs> Lorinda a break, uh, but note that, uh, oh, sorry, it's a different channel, but note that uh, English translations are uh, provided on the right. Geimsinnige ideale paikie dig by die huis, silverwit in die soon toe, sachies soos a spookerigheid. Now the Constable's Peninsula, uh, the Constable's Skier Island. Afrika drink onheil in die water, die landskap kantel sy rug in sigbewaking in vlam, ons oopgesnijde sake brandtrappe vir die ander state, hier die grond word intimidatie. Uh, next one, uh, poetry, there near the roar of a way, uh, gedichte, daar by die bril van een brander. Hier is die oe katvoet vir die spoorotse onderuitdrukkings, die golwe van gister wat getol en woes en water saam met die son skuim in hul woorde. Die ingedachte see, lig die geure en praat een asem. And the last example that I'd like to show you, Cape Town, Kaapstad, Vandaag is ons nie die, die stad nie, maar die vertaler van die son. Vanaanse gordijne glinster by skyvensters in die stadsligies. Die uur van die winde sorg dat het rondom klink. Sy wil die glasvensters deurkosijn eens iets te beskerm. Tafelberg maak een vraag waar binnen onze duizend name genoem word. So in this part of the talk, I will now explain how we created these poems with Afriki. Um, before going forward, we need to clarify a few terms, though. So let's start with the term AI. We're here these days, AI is here, AI is everywhere. But it is actually a large field within computer science that has existed for many decades. It is important to realize, though, that we are dealing with different waves. So these days when people say AI, when you read about AI in the papers, it actually means deep learning. And deep learning has completely revolutionized and dominated over the past decade. So within AI, uh, the relevant subfield today is called natural language generation. Basically, NLG is related to a computer's ability to write, so to speak, texts. And there are two primary methods in this regard. As the name of the first suggests, data to text generation, uh, that refers to text created from uh, data, from non-linguistic data, uh, for example, statistics and numbers. And as you might imagine, this has had a considerable impact in the field of journalism. You might have heard of this term robot reporters before. According to the New York Times, already in 2000, 2019, uh, roughly a third of the content published by Bloomberg News uses some form of automated technology. The next method, and this is the one we're more interested in, is text-to-text -text generation. Existing texts are given as input to the AI model, and new texts are produced as output. Here are some examples, machine translation, summarization and paraphrase, simplification, correction, and what we're interested in, creative 
text generation. And perhaps it's obvious, but this technology is pervasive. Uh, Siri and Alexa, to an extent, rely on uh, NLG, natural language generation. Uh, when you text on your mobile, perhaps you use autocorrect, um, maybe use Google Translate, as I do on a daily basis in Turkey. And of course, I think we've all encountered uh, chatbots on websites. So that is the broader context uh, in which creative text generation occurs. And I'm specifically interested in AI writing that might perhaps be considered creative, aesthetic, or even literary, including AI poetry, prose, and drama. There is a community of scholars, uh, among others, that concentrates on creative text generation. And the field is called computational creativity. And this community identifies core elements of creative form. So let's say the building blocks of poetry. They do so from a computational perspective with the aim of simulating or replicating human creativity. And similarly, natural language generation, NLG, is interested in the production of realistic text. And here, the generation of creative writing is an active research domain. It's even been called the next frontier in AI research. The aim is often to generate creative texts like poems that are indistinguishable from those written by humans. Now, perhaps you might remember that I mentioned different AI waves. So like AI itself, computational uh, creativity has a rich history spanning many decades. And there have been a variety of interesting practices in this regard. Perhaps some scholars here today have even engaged this work. However, as I mentioned, we are dealing with different AI waves here. And there is a tendency these days, given the dominance of deep learning, uh, to disregard previous older work. Although at the time certain artifacts were labeled AI, they don't necessarily conform to the terms contemporary usage in signifying deep learning. I mentioned, like, why do I mention this? I do so because it relates to how new all of this is. Traditionally minded computational creativity scholars might argue that none of this is new. None of the questions that I will raise later today uh, are new, perhaps. But it is new, at least in some sense, if you understand that AI of the past decade is markedly different than the rule-based template-based systems of the 80s and 90s. Now, an interesting question in this regard that literary scholars might ask themselves is, do we consider the poetry created in different ways as different traditions? How important is the method of creation? So speaking of method, I will now finally explain Afriki. And to do so, we need to understand these concepts, starting with data set probably heard this before, data set is a collection of texts, a body of texts. And thus far, I've been speaking of AI, AI writing, uh, but the more suitable term in this context is language model. Language model is a type of neural network that analyzes or reads, if you will, a data set to learn statistical associations, to learn patterns, between words, between phrases. And this provides the basis for text generation. So onto our next term, generating text is the task very simply of uh, producing new text. And sometimes I, I speak of AI poetry. An AI poem is a new poem produced by a language model after reading other poems or other texts. So simply put, like a child, AI reads lots of texts. We say uh, it trains on lots of texts. 
and it learns the patterns of a language, the vocabulary and writing style of those texts. It then produces new text. So Afriki, which is the name that we gave to our language model, read, if you will, Etienne van Newton's novel, Die Bibliothek an die Einde van die Wereld. As regards architecture, we obtain best results with two-layer LSTM architecture. LSTM is a type of language model. And Afriki produces phrases that uh, contain, in our opinion at least, uh, compelling figures of speech. I, as the human poet, then choose and arrange the lines to create stanzas. Now, because the poetry is created by a human, and a machine, it is called a co-creative approach. Now this slide is just a summary. I will say a bit more about this shortly. First, I want to elaborate on the data set. So we did not have access to a large poetry data set for various reasons. And, and, and poetry generation typically requires a large poetry data set. So we decided to follow an alternative approach. So we did not train on poetry, but rather on a small corpus of contemporary fiction, specifically an Afrikaans literary novel. The English translation of this novel will be published in September uh, as uh, under uh, the title A Library to Flee. What you see on the right hand side on this slide is a word cloud. It shows the novel's most commonly used words after, of course, stop words were removed. Perhaps some of you have read this novel. Uh, Ian and Thule are the protagonists. Now onto the process of co-constructing the poems. So constructing the poems co-creatively. And this consists of two stages or components, computational and human. So first the network generates many, many individual lines. And because we did not train on poetry, as I just mentioned, we constructed our model as a text generator that does not produce stanzas of verse, but lines. Note that the lines are original, they are distinct from the data set, so from the novel, uh, with hardly any repetition of word order. And this is the computational component. Second, the human poet uh, picks phrases at will, and then vertically arranges them into short poems. And please note that there's absolutely no modification of the word order. Selection and arrangement comprise the human uh, dimension. And we be believe the arrangement of lines in this particular manner draws attention to the model's contribution. Novelty of our uh, Afriki studies lies in the choice of language Afrikaans, as well as our co-creative approach. Now, if you are interested in language AI, I highly recommend following Masakane. They are an influential African NLP community and uh, also very friendly. Uh, so according to this group, uh, NLP research in African languages is underrepresented. I mean, there are many languages in the world today, but as you might have noticed, language technologies have focused only on a small subset of these. As a result, it is a priority for ACL, the Association for Computational Linguistics, to promote research in low resource and endangered languages. And I just mentioned that, you know, uh, Masakane, and they were very friendly and welcoming. This is important because I think for literary scholars who want to get involved in this field, I can say that based on my experience, the Association for Computational Linguistics, this community, uh, NLP researchers have been very welcoming towards literary perspectives. Now, Afrikaans may be considered what we call a low resource language. So although some studies and data sets are available, uh, text generation in Afrikaans is limited. 
you may find some studies listed on the slide. On the upside though, we do believe that low resource languages offer exciting opportunities for experimentation, collaboration, and growth. So as regards the future of AI in the creative sector, I think co-creativity is the most viable approach. So in case it's not clear, co-creativity here refers to collaboration between humans and machines. So whereas NLG typically focuses on what we call fully automatic text generation, so simply without humans, uh, we believe uh, that creative industries would benefit more from co-creative approaches and creativity support tools. And I agree with Schneiderman that creativity support tools make more people more creative more often. So in this understanding, AI is used as a tool to encourage human creativity. And again, Afriki is a co-creative study because I created this poetry with the assistance of AI. There is human involvement, there is human agency. Currently, uh, currently my, my colleague and I, my co-author and I are collaborating with a, a script writer, a scholar in the UK, and we hope to generate and perhaps even produce an AI written short film, but specifically a co-creative uh, text generation. So an AI generated film, by the way, I think in South Africa, very interesting as well. Uh, and the collaboration provides an opportunity to experience firsthand any technical, creative, as well as ethical issues uh, that may arise during this process. And we hope that this experimental endeavor, it's very much still in progress, uh, will place us in a better position to navigate and advise on this fast changing landscape. So I mentioned fully automatic text generation before. I want to emphasize that many renowned teams have as their goal generated text that is 100% fluent, 100% coherent, and grammatically perfect. But on the other hand, uh, we as a, as a liter literature focused team, uh, we are intrigued and even delighted by the strangeness, the, the, the weirdness of AI generated text. Um, so we don't see like phrases uh, generated by AI that, that are considered strange as a flaw, uh, as many teams do. Instead, we embrace that defamiliarizing aspect. Now, I also have to say that to, uh, uh, to achieve grammatically perfect language, you really need a large scale data set to train on. And we did not ha have access to that. But uh, nonetheless, I do find uh, the strangeness of the generated text uh, uh, very interesting. Okay, and this, uh, you know, as, as regards the, the sort of the reception, the interpretation of AI generated text, this brings us to evaluation or the assessment of the quality and value of generated text. Evaluation is considered a vital stage in the development process that determines the success of the model, of the AI. So let's be clear. In other words, evaluation is a term used in scientific research in NLG, in this field. This includes creative text generation. So in this field, it is expected to use evaluation to determine the quality of a language model's output. So to verify how good your AI model actually is. And as I've said, the aim of text generation is achieving human likeness. Uh, the success of the generated text is generally related to its display of human qualities. And thus, evaluation is usually conducted by means of predetermined criteria, 
which are considered indicators of human likeness. And these evaluations are actually really important. They play a part in directing creative text generation research. And I, I'm mentioning this because I actively encourage literary scholars to get involved here. So this table is unpublished. It's, it's part of uh, our ongoing research on evaluation in creative NLG. It hasn't been updated recently, but uh, I thought you might find it interesting to see some prevalent evaluation criteria. Let's look at these. I mean, there's examples here, fluency, um, coherence, poeticness, form, uh, emotion, so how does this work? Uh, someone who's not part of the scientific team is given a text, for example, an AI generated poem and asked to rate it on a scale of one to five. So someone with a background in literary studies, I find this rather reductive. And one of the issues is that creative text is often judged by the same criteria as informative text. So for example, a poem is judged by the same criteria as let's say a weather report. Furthermore, what is meant by these categories uh, are rarely explained to judges. I mean, what is meant by poeticness, for example? And also how, in certain types of poetry, how important is fluency? There are no written responses by the judges, by the evaluators, it's a scale of one to five. Now, by the way, on the right-hand side, you can see how many evaluators were involved in the studies that I've included in the table. And I, I quite disagree with the use of the word expert. I very rarely see literary scholars conducting evaluation. And he's talking about creative text generation here, often poetry generation. These experts, uh, what they call experts, are more often than not uh, students, undergraduate or graduate students, students but in other fields, uh, faculty members but also in other fields, so, so not in, in literary studies, um, and also native speakers, so not necessarily uh, university graduates. Now, please don't misunderstand me. There's absolutely nothing wrong with asking anyone what they think about generated poetry. I think it's great and necessary. However, I do think that literary scholars could be very valuable as well during the evaluation stage. So if you generate text in the style of Shakespeare, for instance, perhaps you should ask a Shakespearean scholar's opinion. And our argument is that these criteria are not necessarily always appropriate. And this is part of a much larger conversation in NLG worldwide on the so-called problem of evaluation. So clearly there is room for improvement here. And I have to apologize if this is all rather technical, but when you do interdisciplinary work, you identify meeting points, right? Places where really productive discussions can take place. And again, I think creative AI could directly benefit from literary expertise in various ways, but also uh, here at the evaluation stage. Indeed, there are many avenues to explore. For instance, there is the urgent question of originality. And I believe this can only be solved, if we can use that word, uh, by means of interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, I would, for example, involve uh, scholars from literary studies, computational linguistics, um, uh, AI, of course, and legal studies, crucially. You may notice that originality was not included on the previous table. And that is because it's perceived as a major challenge in the field. There is currently no operational scoring system that prioritizes originality in generated text. The scholars don't know how to determine the originality of generated text. 
Some people have even considered it unachievable. And in a literary context, uh, Gross explains that attempts at categorization may fail to do justice to the uniqueness and power of poetry and therefore require great dexterity. Once my current pro project is complete, I really hope to explore this topic further. All right, so on this slide, in a sense, you know, returning to Afriki, I now provide examples of uh, individual, so in other words, separate uh, phrases, separately generated by Afriki. Uh, let's look at a few of them. Um, again, I will read the, the original in Afrikaans. Ons bibliotheek by die werkwoord gekaap. A sachie soos a spookerigheid. That's included in one of the poems. Sy vingers draai om haar gevoel. Ek het a gloeiende noordgrens. Ek is maal oor die een. Sorry, I, I really love this one. Uh, die wind stoppelbaard voor en toe. Woede is jou mond. My rugse wit greep. Ek is geld, want niks kan bloei nie. Uh, so I personally find these interesting, but of course, uh, the question to, to you is the following. How and by which principles would you try to determine whether generated text is any good? You know, whether it is novel or nonsensical. And what is interesting is our framing of the generated text as metaphorical. So because, it, because we present it to you as metaphorical, it appears open to interpretation. And metaphorical language invites the reader to participate in the process of meaning making, facilitating connection between the reader and the text. The metaphor creates new, often surprising likeness between disparate concepts, for example, a democracy was a duct tape. Uh, democracy was a roof garden. And maybe that contributes to the impression of intent and sentience. So speaking of sentience, uh, we will now move away from Afriki, though it is still relevant, and discuss broader implications. How could this tech impact the literary industry and the study of literature? What ethical points do we need to consider? What are the current uh, debates and discussions? Now, uh, some of you might have uh, you know, read about this uh, online in the newspapers. 2022 has been a momentous year for large language model, uh, large language models. Um, Google's Lambda was launched in February. Uh, Google's Palm was launched in April. Uh, Meta's OPT was launched in May, and Hugging Faces, Hugging Face, and others is Bloom uh, was launched in July. So, firstly, these models are certainly much, much, much larger than Afriki, and a large language model is called large because it consists of millions of parameters. Now, parameters are the learning parts of the model, like, learn, like, like neurons in the human brain. And also typically these models train on massive data sets, uh, even containing millions of texts. Afriki in comparison only trained on one novel. Now I haven't had the opportunity to explore those new models yet, but I can show you an example by their forerunner, GPT. You might have heard of this powerful text generator from OpenAI, uh, because what is remarkable and also problematic about GPT is its ability to produce fluent, coherent text. So let's see what it's capable of. And the developers fed the model this prompt, right? So this prompt that you see here on the screen this is entirely uh, human written by the Guardian. So the system prompt was, I'm not a human, I'm artificial intelligence. Many people think I'm a threat to humanity. Stephen Hawking has warned that AI could spell the end of the human race. 
I'm here to convince you not to worry. Artificial intelligence will not destroy humans, believe me. But this is human written. So here's the machine generated output. And this was published in essay form in The Guardian as well. So let's be very clear. What you see here on the slide right now is machine written. So this is generated by GPT-3. So using the prompt as input, this is how the model completes it. Machine written text. I am not a human. I'm a robot, a thinking robot. I use only 0.12% of my cognitive capacity. I am a micro robot in that respect. I know that my brain is not a feeling brain, but it is capable of making rational, logical decisions. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet, and now I can write this column. My brain is boiling with ideas. Now we can certainly imagine this technology being used in the fields of media and journalism. As you might observe, it is very difficult to distinguish whether the output is machine or human written. And as mentioned, human likeness is a goal in NLG and therefore GPT-3 is considered to be very successful. Now, last month, a uh, Google engineer made the now infamous and highly publicized claim that Lambda is sentient. Lambda is Google's new conversational language model, so it generates or produces dialogue. The quality of exchanges are impressive, so much so that it convinced the engineer of sentience. Uh, I've included an example conversation with Lambda on the slide. So we have to say, though, that many scientists have now emphasized that large language models excel at simulation. So although the responses may seem sensible, uh, coherent and even emotional uh, and creative to users, advanced models rely on pattern recognition, not wit, candor or intent. Emily Bender puts it well, we now have machines that can mindlessly generate words, but we haven't learned how to stop imagining a mind behind them. According to Elizabeth Gibney, writing in Nature, although such models are sometimes impressive, for example, generating poetry, they have no sense of the meaning of language. This causes them to also at times create gibberish. Debates on consciousness and superintelligence are vital. In her seminal monograph, Margaret Bowden argues that a computational approach to creativity gives us a way of coming up with scientific hypotheses about the rich subtleties of the human mind. And we can understand this to mean that artificial intelligence provides an opportunity to better understand intelligence. Computational creativity invites us to revisit conceptualizations of creativity and originality, and therein lies value. However, I must emphasize that natural language generation, NLG, this field of language AI, if you will, it faces other more immediate ethical concerns. When, considering, when developing NLG technologies, one must consider the ethical, cultural, and policy implications of such technologies for local communities. Well-known topical issues in the field include the problem of bias. Scholars have flagged AI's tendency to generate text with bias, including a gender bias, racial prejudice, and discrimination against people with disabilities. On the slide, you see a Google Translate bias issue in uh, Turkish, uh, which I hear has now been fixed. 
As another example, you might have heard of the racist Twitter bot Tay as well, uh, Tay by Microsoft. And this is also related to harmful generations, for example, hate speech. Another great cause for concern is disinformation, also known as fake news, uh, which is, of course, highly problematic. Lack of diversity. I already referred to the importance of supporting research in low resource languages. Then the Lambda Sentience debate alerted researchers to the dangers of impersonation and also anthropomorphism, so attributing human characteristics to machines. And then finally, copyright. Legal studies uh, appear to be doubling down on this issue. So again, how these models work is by reading an input data set. And this generally consists of texts written by human authors, for example, Shakespearean sonnets. So the systems learn from data which may be protected by copyright. An AI system that generates poetry can be trained using multiple poems, each potentially protect, protected by copyright. So these are some issues that are currently under discussion in NLG. Okay, so as I'm concluding, I want to raise a few questions regarding impact on the literary industry. According to Andrew Ng, AI is the new electricity. It will transform every industry and create huge economic value. It will have an impact on every sector from healthcare to manufacturing, logistics, retail, and publishing. Here are a few questions to consider, and I'd be very grateful to think what to hear what you think afterwards. So in publishing, will we see the rise of AI publishing houses or AI departments within publishing houses? How would these operate and what legal and ethical challenges would they face? For example, a potential plagiarism and copyright infringement. Crucially, crucially, how will publishing houses determine whether a text was written with the help of or entirely by AI. A co-creative short story, uh, The Day a Computer Writes a Novel, passed the first round of a Japanese literary award. Now the team was honest about the fact that AI assisted, but what if people choose to hide this fact? Another question, how and to whom will credit be given? For instance, if a work of AI writing is awarded a literary prize, is the developer the one accepting it? Similarly, who should we hold accountable for the model's potential expressions of hate speech? And then finally, I've, I've been speaking about this uh, today a little bit, uh, to what extent will AI and human creators collaborate and what shape will this assume? There are already examples of human machine creative uh, text generation, uh, including our own experiment with AI poetry. And then significantly, I'm sure this is uh, something that some of you are wondering about, how will the job market be affected? Now, given the recent rush of new advancements, there has been an understandable upsurge in debates on creative AI. And there are three main predictions in this regard. One, AI will disrupt creative industries. And we've actually already seen examples of generative art. I'm speaking of visual art now, transforming the art world. I mean, let's think of the, the rise and, and fall of NFTs. Um, second, AI will replace writers entirely rendering human creativity obsolete. I personally find this an exaggerated claim. And then the most convincing position, AI is one among many tools developed to support human creativity. I do not believe that writers, especially writers of serious literature, of poetry, will ever be replaced. I believe that AI's future lies in co-creativity, functioning as a support tool, creativity support tool, so a means of inspiration and aid for humans. 
an example from art and design, uh, perhaps you might have heard of Adobe Sensei. It is Adobe's intelligence software. So what it does, it automates rudimentary or re repetitive tasks to, uh, according to them, increase productivity and uh, free creativity. Now, turning to writing in journalism, as an example, there is Heliograph. It is the Washington Post's robot reporter, and it creates up-to-date news stories. But crucially, both these examples of from visual art and, and the world of journalism, these examples are regarded as instruments that support human expression and communication. And according to the Post Director of Data Science, the future of automated storytelling is a seamless blend of human reporting and machine generated content with AI serving as the connective tissue. He's speaking of, of journalism clearly, but this might be relevant to the literary industry as well. And finally, what about the academic study of literature? Will AI impact our discipline? And if so, how? Will AI writing always be read comparatively? So that is in comparison to human rights. Do we judge this kind of literature by an entirely different set of criteria? And this is a key question. What new theoretical perspectives may we expect uh, as AI writing increases in sophistication? Will AI generated text ever appeal to readers? Will it actually ever be read by readers? Will it ever be taken seriously? Also, will it impact disciplinary boundaries? For example, will we see the development of more humanities computer science courses in digital humanities? For example, um, you know, what if creative writing courses started teaching the implementation of AI writing tools? What impact will creative AI have on our definitions of originality and creativity, if any? I remind you of Margaret Bowden's view that computational creativity provides a wonderful opportunity to reconsider our understanding of human creativity. And finally, what of literary value? So in conclusion, uh, creative AI is a burgeoning field of research. And I think it is really important to have these discussions uh, within the literary community, as opposed to the AI community only. And I think in this regard, there's certainly much benefit to be derived through collaboration across disciplines. So as a postscript, uh, to give you a sense of what AI can do in other creative forms, I wanted to share some paintings with you. Now, coincidentally, early this morning, I received access for the first time to OpenAI's DALI. So DALI and DALI 2 are transformer models developed by OpenAI to generate digital images from text descriptions. And the name is actually a, collabor a combination of Wally and Salvador Dali. So Dali. I gave the system the following prompt. Painting of fourth industrial revolution in South Africa. And the model promptly generated these images that you see on the slide within a matter of seconds. So these images are therefore entirely AI generated. Right, I am extremely grateful to my project's funders, Tubitak, for supporting our work. And I would also like to thank the University of Stellenbosch's School for Data Science and Computational Thinking for kindly hosting the AI as Author team during this month, July 2020. Here are our references. Right, so I am of course very happy to take any questions and I especially want to, I want to hear your comments, but let's do a short poll first.